Okay, uh, we'll get started. I think it's 11 o'clock. Close to it. Uh, we will uh, first uh, uh, ask each of the candidates to introduce themselves and uh, give a uh, two to three minute, you know, little plug about why you think they should, you should be sheriff in your background. Oh, yeah, one with the hat. <laughs> So we'll start with uh, Don Everhart, right here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Don Everhart, and I'm one of the candidates on the Republican ticket for Taylor County Sheriff. And one of the reasons I'm running for sheriff is I believe that I have a background um, with the county and the skills that would help the sheriff's department continue to move forward. Um, I started in Taylor County working in 1986 as a social worker. I did child abuse investigations and juvenile probation. That got me very familiar with working with law enforcement and the Taylor County Courthouse. During that time, I also ran a martial arts studio, and many officers were taking martial arts from me. And through that connection with them training in martial arts, they suggested I go to the police academy. I did subsequently go to the police academy and graduated and worked as a deputy for Taylor County, did some work in it for Abbotsford Police Department also. Um, I was probably involved in it for about four years, working on and off part-time. As I was working as a deputy, I went back to school and got a master's degree in counseling, and that allowed me then to become a counselor working for the Human Services After Hours. I do all their crisis interventions. It's about 130 calls a year if people are suicidal or depressed, they call me in. That work often connects me with law enforcement late at night because they're often responding to those same individuals. And as I worked with law enforcement, uh, kind of hand in glove over the last 30 years, I've developed relationships with many of the officers and administration over the years. And I've come to the conclusion that one of the things that lacks often um, in the work, and it's not just through the management, but it's the job that they do, is it's hard to keep your morale up. You have a lot of negative contact, you often deal with crises, and I believe my background in working with people would improve that. I also have gained a lot of knowledge through my administration and leadership work um, in the school district. I have a master's degree in administration and through that uh, educational background I've worked with managing a school district, the budgets, the teachers, those types of things. And I believe my management experience will come in very helpful because even though a lot of times people think of the sheriff as a police officer, which he is, um, a lot of the work is managerial. It's a managing your staff, it's managing budgets, and I have experience and background in doing that and I think that that would also help the Sheriff's Department um, bringing in some new ideas. Um, every organization has room for improvement, and I believe that uh, I have some fresh ideas on employee evaluations that would encourage employees to give 110%, which then of course factors out to benefits to the public. So I think my time's probably up. I'm going to pass the mic on to the next person. Thank you for your time, and it's a pleasure to see you here this morning. the candidate forum this morning. I'm Craig Amundsen. I'm a Democrat candidate for Taylor County Sheriff. I was born and raised right here in Taylor County. I actually grew up a little bit north of here in Whittlesea, a tiny little town. Um, but you know, I know that Taylor County is a great place, great community, a great place to live. Um, you know, I'm, I'm committed to this community and uh, committed to this community long term. So a little bit about my background. I uh, have a background in computer science. Uh, I went to college for that for in Downing UW-Madison. Um, I have an associate degree in criminal justice and I have been a law enforcement officer for over 12 years. Um, over 11 of that has been with the Taylor County Sheriff's Office. I'm currently a patrol sergeant with the Sheriff's Office and I have been a patrol sergeant for over four years. Um, the patrol sergeant position has given me uh, direct leadership experience with leading the patrol operations and answering questions and guiding deputies in, in uh, any questions that they have. You know, it's really important as a leader to make sure you're always available, always there to answer questions, and always be there for um, the, the people that work for you. And uh, as sheriff, um, the people that matter also is the, the community. And as sheriff, I will make sure that I am responsive to the needs of the community because the sheriff position is an elected constitutional position, and the importance of that is that the community is involved in the process of how the sheriff's office is run. 
and that is why that everybody here gets a, gets a choice and gets to elect the candidate that they believe is best. Um, also with the Sheriff's Office, I worked in emergency management. Um, I did that for over three years and that gave me valuable experience and uh, interactions with the other emergency services in Taylor County, the ambulance services, all the fire departments, and you know we're all one big team and one big family. We all need to work together. When somebody calls 911 or has an emergency, they want everybody to come, they want everybody to work together. And I have a lot of experience in you know, working with all those different agencies, um, especially with EMS, because I'm also an advanced EMT with the uh, Medford Ambulance, and I've been doing that for over seven years. So I have a strong background in, in all sorts of public safety, and all that is information and an experience that I can apply directly to the position as sheriff. Good morning. Uh, so I'm Larry Webbinkink, also a candidate for sheriff, obviously. And I think I'll just give you a little bit about my background. Um, I started in law enforcement back in the mid 80s. Uh, I worked for Russ County Sheriff's Department back then. I was a dispatcher and a road deputy. I worked part time. Well, back in the mid 80s, uh, not unlike now, uh, back in the mid 80s, it was hard to get on full time in law enforcement. Now it's just the other way around. Uh, if you, if you get into law enforcement, you're almost guaranteed a job. But back then, there was more people than there were positions. So striving to get full-time experience, I started applying for some of the bigger cities throughout the United States. And I was ultimately hired and worked for the Reno Police Department in Reno, Nevada. So I, I lived out in Reno, worked for the PD out there as a police officer. Gave me a uh, kind of a perspective of bigger city law enforcement, which really gives you appreciation about small town law enforcement and the service that we get here. Well, because of some family health issues, my family were back here in Wisconsin. That drew me back to Wisconsin, and I was hired in Gilman as the chief of the police in Gilman on the west end of Taylor County. Well, working with Gilman, then obviously I worked closely with the Taylor County Sheriff's Department, and I was ultimately hired here at the Sheriff's Department by then Sheriff Don Wright. And I've been here at the Sheriff's Department ever since. That's pretty close to 30 years now. During my time here at the Sheriff's Department, I've held several roles. Some of those roles include jail and dispatch. Uh, I've been a road officer, a uniformed road officer, been a sergeant, SWAT team commander, uh, detective. I've also been the chief deputy in my current position now. Uh, working those many roles, which is almost all of the roles that the Sheriff's Department has to offer, working those many roles has really given me a unique perspective of how the Sheriff's Department runs and every aspect of it. Um, <clears throat> moving forward, one of the things that I would like to do as Sheriff is back when I started years ago, uh, it, it seemed like we kind of knew, the, the officers knew the public and, and the public knew them. So when I first started here, you couldn't call, almost kind of go any, but anywhere and somebody would say, hey, there goes Donnie Wright, or there goes Frank Phyllis, or all those no names that, that some of you may recognize. And the point is, the public seemed to know the officers, and, and because of the hustle and bustle of our modern society, we don't seem to do that anymore. I'd kind of like to take a step back and uh, do things like have a booth here at the fair, maybe have something down at the car show, like on the other end of the, the city today. You could have a squad car there, let the kids take a picture. And my point is that if we can interact a little bit as law enforcement community, service I, I, absolutely gets better because we have a, a bit of a connection. And you're not just a strange squad car running through, driving through the town. You're all of a sudden Larry or, or Nick or Eric. And I, I just think you bring some of that hometown flavor back and services get better and we just get along better as a community. And uh, I'll turn the mic over to Brian now and thank you very much. Okay. Okay, our uh, first question here is, uh, being sheriff is about leadership, often under pressure. What is your leadership style, and you can, can you share an example, a leadership situation that you were involved with? So I get to respond first. We drew names or numbers, um, so I had drawn the number one. Working under pressure is a constant in most of the roles that I currently have. Um, I'm currently the Taylor County crisis on-call worker. So at two or three o'clock in the morning, they'll call me about a suicidal subject down at the hospital. They may have overdosed, they may have stabbed themselves. Uh, there may be other issues going on. 
When I get down there, everyone from the police officer to the doctor to the nurses, they're all waiting for me to make a decision. They want to know, what are you going to do with this person? Now, that's a lot of responsibility and you're under a lot of pressure because everybody's being tied up at that time. Doctors are there, officers are off the road maintaining uh, safety for the employees. And you have to figure it out. So you have to be able to talk to someone, you have to be able to quickly grasp the, the gravity of the situation to determine what is in the best interest of that individual. And sometimes it's not always what everyone else wants. The doctors might be saying, you need to lock them up. And I might be thinking to myself, this person is on low income, they don't have the money to cover an inpatient, and I don't think their situation is that serious. I think they could benefit from outpatient services, and I'm going help that way. So you have to make those decisions. And I do that on a regular basis, and that's probably one of my claims to fame, is I am willing to do that. That's why people are calling me. All these other uh, individuals often involved in these situations, they don't want to have the responsibility. Let's call human services, because then it's off our back. And when it's all said and done, the person whose back it's hanging on is mine. And I've done those calls, over 3,000 of them in my career. And so I'm okay with taking responsibility because I often feel that I evaluate the situation accurately and can make the best decision necessary. As an example of where I've done a lot of leadership is uh, several years ago, one of my school teachers, when I was um, in my role as a school principal, died in a tragic snowmobile accident. And that was a very difficult time. Uh, my staff, they're very close. This person was a personal friend of theirs. Students were gonna come to school on Monday and their teacher wasn't gonna be there and we had to explain to them about how she died. There were just a lot of issues with that. And so I coordinated having everybody coming in on the weekend. We had several meetings. We found ways to memorialize that teacher to keep her spirit alive with all of us. Um, we had to deal with staff who were having a very hard time family members, it was very difficult, but I feel when it was all said and done that we managed it in a way that was considerate and compassionate to the family, it was productive for the teachers, and we all grew in that event, and myself as well. Um, I don't have all the answers. I also take a lot of uh, lead from the people that I'm working with. What do you need? And so managing that sudden death of one of my staff persons um, is an example where I think I demonstrated a, a a large amount of leadership and then of course in my daily routines with working with human services and those crisis calls demonstrates my willingness to work under pressure and to come up with solutions. I think the question was twofold and uh, I'll, my management style um, I would just like to say that I, I believe in the staff that we have. We have good qualified people and that um, I would like to see them excel. And, and they don't always need day-to-day -day guidance. They, they're good people, they can make really good decisions. And so I would, as, as a management style, mine would be to prom promote self-confidence from within. They shouldn't have to ask a question all the time. They shouldn't have to go to their supervisor all the time. We have good qualified people and I would like to see them all excel. Um, in terms of some of the uh, decisions I've made over the years, um, well, that's 30 years of law enforcement, so there's been a lot of decisions. Um, but some of the things I do on a daily basis would be, um, for example, if uh, a lot of times officers will call or stop in or call in the middle of the night about warrants, for example. Do we need a warrant to enter a house? Uh, a subject just fled on foot and now they're in this, this cabin or there's somebody's houses how do you know how do we proceed do we need a warrant do we need to or can we just go in after this person so you make kind of day-to-day -day decisions on 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 legal stuff like that on the law um, decisions on staffing and scheduling those are ongoing daily so uh, on, on any given day we're we're, we're short-handed so we have to make day-to-day uh, -day staffing decisions in terms of how we can move these officers in how we can work and cut our, our shifts. Now we're mandated, mandated in the jail to have a certain amount of staffing levels. And if you think about the jail, we've got to have male and female on staff because we have male and female inmates. So there's staffing concerns about our, you know, they have male and female on too. Uh, SWAT is another one. Uh, planning SWAT uh, entries, and those types of things, those are life and death. I mean, you, you have to do it right. So when you're, when you're talking about maybe making an entry into a house where somebody's held in there with a gun or has a hostage or something like that, um, those are things that I've planned and uh, 
give a lot of guidance to. So it doesn't get too much more important, I think, than human life. Um, budgetary constraints, I also work with the budget. So there's, there's things that the budget, uh, the Sheriff's Department budget is just a little over four million a year. And we break that up into about uh, 2.2 million for the road operation, and about 1.9 million, something like that, for the jail. So that's, that's not a small budget. So in terms of the budget, we have to be fiscally responsible to all of you in this room as taxpayers. So I deal with the budget as well. And furthermore, I do uh, meetings with our detectives. So we have a detective staff, and they, and they do more of the investigative things and the felonies and the bigger cases like that. So I would meet with the detectives, we go over their caseload, give them direction if they, if they have any questions on, on how to proceed in their investigations, because I, I was a detective at one time myself. So those are just some of the examples um, that come off the top of my head, there's many more, but uh, that, that, that's some of the things we do on a daily basis. All right, my uh, leadership style has always been to lead by example, to always do what's right when nobody is looking, because that is what matters. As sheriff, obviously, um, you know, the sheriff's role is not to be out there um, on a day-to-day -day basis. The sheriff's role is to lead the department, to still be a good role model of behavior and examples for all of the uh, employees that we have, the deputies, the jailers, the administrative staff. We have outstanding employees in our department, and as uh, Chief Deputy said, there's no, no uh, direct supervision that's needed all the time. But the, the reason I went into law enforcement is because you can make such powerful impacts in people's lives. And it's just every day as a law enforcement officer, you are making split-second decisions, you are making decisions that affect other people's lives. And those people's lives can be affected in, in very positive or very negative ways. And the way that we handle those situations is that we treat people with respect and dignity no matter what. And you know, one of the things that, that feels so great when you're in law enforcement is I have a small thing. It seems so minor. It's just a piece of paper with water coloring on it. And this is what a small child gave me when I came to his house because he was just so happy. Um, you know, that's policies and procedures are often viewed as something boring, but it's absolutely necessary. You have to have um, those in place. Um, there's legal ramifications for the department and legal liability um, if those things aren't done right. And But the number one most important resource that a department has is its people. And that is the most important thing about leadership, is taking care of the employees and taking care of the people. And that is how I will lead the Sheriff's Office. Okay, just as a reminder, there's uh, uh, chairs on either side of the, uh, the room here with uh, slips of paper. So if you have a, uh, a topic you want to have addressed, uh, write it down on that uh, piece of paper and, and bring it up to me. And as time allows, we'll, we'll be asking those. Um, our next question, uh, while the law is the law, the sheriff has wide discretion in establishing enforcement priorities. For example, choosing to go after bank robbers rather than jaywalkers. Uh, what would be your enforcement priorities as sheriff in establishing policy for the department and why? I think that's a pretty broad question. It's almost a little difficult to answer. Um, yeah, the sheriff has uh, a lot of authority, statutory authority. Um, but I, and I, like what Brian just said, I think the law is the law. Um, and I, I don't have an enforcement priority in terms of being sheriff. Um, certainly, um, the day-to-day -day things, uh, you know, the, the small things like uh, uh, traffic violation or something like that. Um, you know, we, I, I don't, I don't know that um, that would be a, a, a significant uh, change that you would see or anything like that. I mean, people are just going to work and uh, they're trying to get to work and get on with their day. We don't need to be uh, very strict in that terms. We'll just go out uh, like we have been. Um, in terms of just anything specific, I can't think of anything because 
we are a nation and a county and a, and a city governed by laws and, and we, you know, the, the Sheriff's Department nor the Sheriff himself makes law. Um, we just enforce the law that legislation gives to us. And we don't have a lot of uh, uh, decision-making process in, in the law making of it or even if we necessarily agree with it. The only thing that we can do as, as Sheriff is enforce the laws that legislation has given us. So as Sheriff, I would just do that. I mean, basically we enforce the laws that the legislation has, has uh, provided us already and we wouldn't go after any specific law with any great vigor that we would normally do. Uh, we would just enforce the laws and the violations as they come through. All right. The, for me, the number one priority is always going to be to protect people. So the priority for the Sheriff's Office is always going to be taking care of people. So if that means responding to you know, vehicle crashes, taking care of people that are injured, um, even when it comes to uh, ambulance calls. If there's somebody available then and we're nearby and we can help, we should be going there because the number one most important thing is protecting people. After that, then it becomes a, a sense of just enforcing the law. Um, there's an obvious you know, hierarchy of you know, people going a little bit over the speed limit are not the priority when there's somebody that, that called in and has and requests to see an officer for whatever reason because they're calling because they have a concern, they want to see an officer and they deserve to, to be able to see an officer and talk to one. So, like I said, number one priority is always going to be the people and taking care of people. priority for me at the, the Sheriff's Department would be basically that interpersonal relationship skills that I think are so important in just about every field, but I have a lot of experience with that through my background in counseling, and I guess in a nutshell, you know, go out there, enforce the law, but don't be a jerk. I mean, we all know those kind of stories where somebody's being stopped, I and mean, I don't think it's Taylor County, but you read them in the paper from other cities where people talk about where they feel they're being unjustly treated or they're being targeted. My concept is let's use some common sense. And I think also in this day and age with technology, we could use some data. So as an example, officers certainly write citations. It's part of the job. It's how we change behavior. But they also have the ability to write warnings. I would be one who would be inclined to track and look at seeing how many traffic stops are warnings and how many are tickets. I think the warnings develop good community relations. We've all had the blue and red lights in our rear view mirror and think, oh my gosh, I hope I get a warning. Well, that actually builds relationships, but it also changes the behavior. Chances are that person is slowing down when they get back on the road. But if we use warnings as a tool, it also allows us to make more traffic stops to find individuals that are maybe wanted for um, criminal offenses. So it's good policing to have these stops occur because that's oftentimes where we find those that need to be taken off the streets. But it also builds relationships. So one of the things I do when I do trainings, I do a lot of public speaking, is I talk about we often need to send a positive relationship message even though we're sending a negative content message. So if you do a traffic stop, you can say to someone, you know ma'am, I'm going to issue a citation today because I find it's the most effective way to slow people down. A bump at 35 miles an hour is a launching pad at 75. I'm sure your family would like to see you get home safely tonight. Now when you leave, they don't drive away thinking, boy, I hope that nice officer stops me again tomorrow. But you have delivered that positive relationship message. I care about you, I care about your family, and I'm out here to make a difference. So that would be basically my approach, is that we use a common sense approach, we treat people like we would want to be treated, and we make enforcement important, but we also look at developing those relationships because every contact with every person is a chance to build that relationship. Okay. Um from the next question I have is uh, I actually go to a question from the audience here. Um, explain how you feel about Second Amendment rights and concealed carry rights, and arming the pub and arming the public in public places. All right. uh, 
thank you to whoever asked that question. The, any questions from the public are certainly greatly appreciated. Uh, my personal belief and the, the way I will be sheriff is the Constitution absolutely guarantees a right to personal ownership and possession of firearms. The Second Amendment is an absolute right to own and possess firearms. So my opinion on that is that, uh, you know, people should be able to certainly have firearms in their homes, use them for hunting. I support concealed carry. I, you know, I am a gun owner and obviously a law enforcement officer, so I carry a gun on a, a regular basis. And, you know, the most important thing is just to make sure that you're safe and are using um, any firearms in a responsible manner, as the vast majority of firearm owners do. And, you know, the important thing, I guess, my, you know, advice, so to speak, for people who carry firearms is to just make sure you're trained and uh, make sure that you're proficient with your firearm because you just you want to make sure that when you're using something that can be as dangerous as a firearm, you just need to make sure you're doing it safely. So I absolutely believe in the Second Amendment as a uh, right to own and possess firearms, and I just you know encourage people to, to be responsible and safe. I'm a big Second Amendment supporter. Um, I've currently been teaching concealed carry classes in Taylor County for the past six years. Um, I believe firearms are a useful tool, and like all tools, it depends on whose hands they're in. A basketball in Michael Jordan's hands is worth millions, and one in my hand isn't worth two cents. But uh, it depends on who's handling it. I believe that uh, self-defense is a human right. Oftentimes, uh, hunting is uh, very popular. I'm a hunter. But that's not what the Second Amendment was about. Second Amendment was about self-protection, about protecting your safety, your rights, and protecting your family. So as an instructor, I teach a lot about safety, but I also teach how to properly use firearms, and I think that's important. One of the things I would like to do if I become sheriff, and granted, I don't get to do everything I want to do, I'm sure if I become sheriff, I have to work with the county board, but I would like to see that the police range be open maybe two or three times a year where it's staffed by officers who actually allow people who haven't had a chance to familiarize themselves with a firearm, learn how to load the magazine or load the cylinder, learn how to hold that firearm, and learn how to handle it safely. Now certainly they're not going to become experts in an afternoon, but it would be an opportunity to expose people who want to learn to protect themselves and exercise that right by having some professional officers engage with them. Those officers then have a chance to develop better community relations, and of course we help the community be safer because people know how to handle their firearms. As an instructor doing concealed carry classes, I've always offered individuals who have not had shooting experience before to contact me and come out to my house. I have my own pistol range. And last month someone came out. I said, well, where would you like to start? And she said, the beginning. I've never fired a gun before. Within a couple hours, she had it down pretty well. So, um, in kind of summation, number one is I totally support the Second Amendment. I believe it's an important right of the Constitution. Number two, I believe that the Second Amendment would be an opportunity for the sheriff's deputies to get to know citizens better by providing some of that training under supervision. And number three, I think that the right to own and bear arms is unique to the United States, and that's something we should be proud of and that the problem has never been out of citizens with firearms. It's the other people that have problems or criminal elements that are causing most of the havoc. And taking away guns from the good guys is not how you stop the bad guys. I also am a supporter of the Second Amendment concealed carry. I'm a gun owner myself for many years. Um, you know, the concealed carry, it's a good thing because what you have is you have honest people, good law-abiding citizens doing the right thing to conceal carry, right? They're taking their training, they're filling out their forms, they're registering to do that. Those are the good law-abiding people that we want to have firearms. You know, the bad people, the bad ones that we're scared of that are going to do bad things aren't going through that process anyway. You know, they're just going to do what they want. Those are the really bad people. So in terms of concealed carry, I think those are all good, honest people and doing the right thing so that they can ha uh, have a concealed carry 
and feel safer. So I'm, I'm a supporter of that. And again, um, uh, um, being a gun owner myself and carrying off duty myself, I can appreciate anybody's concerned to want to do that and their, and their uh, legal right to do so. Um, just to touch base a little bit on Mr. Everhart's um, comment about law enforcement training at the range, um, although I'm 110% about uh, interacting with the public, but the things you got to start thinking of that is liabilities for the county, and all of you are the taxpayers in here. And uh, as soon as an officer might start training the public, um, then who's got the deep pockets when something goes wrong but our county? And so you got to be careful on the lawsuit end of it. So if, if, if our range officer who normally teaches our officers interacts with pubs and give them some sort of a shooting guidance uh, and they mistakenly shoot somebody or some sort of bad accident happens, the county may be liable. And also being on, on government property while you're training them and then something happens there. Um, so we got to really think these things through too as well when we talk about interacting with the public, especially when it comes to firearms. But uh, just to sum it up, I'm a big supporter of concealed carry. Open carry is, uh, is also legal. And Second Amendment. Okay, um, just to uh, remind everybody that we will be, uh, we are video, uh, we are recording this, and this will be uh, posted online. Um, probably by tomorrow morning, uh, that is my goal. So, um, the, uh, our, our next question is, uh, current Sheriff Bruce Daniels often comments that his accounting degree is sometimes as important as his law enforcement training and doing his job uh, with the, with the uh, multi-million dollar budget in the Sheriff's Department. Much of the Sheriff's job is administrative oversight what is your background with budgeting, scheduling, and financial management? So to answer that question, um, as a school administrator, I'm involved in typical administrative duties. The Medford School District has over a $20 million budget, and uh, as part of that, each school building has a budget. So we look at things such as what teachers need and what teachers want, and those aren't always the same things. Ideally, we like to provide for what people want as well. Um, oftentimes their requests are not extreme. The items that they're requesting will help them do their job. So I think it's important to bring a balance to those types of things. Um, I do a lot of staffing supervision. Large portion of being a principal is observing teachers in the classroom, writing up uh, professional development plans. How can they improve? And a lot of what I would like to take from my management experience there is to bring that into the department. I'd like to see a more formalized evaluation process for officers. And it's not to just point out what they're not doing right. It's to point out what they're doing well equally, because we want to reinforce the good behaviors. But everybody, including myself, probably has areas where we can improve. In my school, I think I'm one of the only buildings, every year I send out a survey to my teachers and ask them to evaluate me. It's anonymous, and sometimes someone writes something and you think, oh, that's not true. I'm not like that. But you have to step back and realize that there's always some truth in everything. And I think that evaluation process should be a two-way street. So I would use that with officers and jailers and others in the department. I'd like to see, you know, annually, what am I doing that they like and what am I doing that they don't like? And then vice versa, I would be evaluating them. So I do do a lot with the budget. The schools, we have to make sure that we stay within our expenses. And basically that's about prioritizing needs. I don't believe I necessarily have all the answers. In my school system, I have a team called the Liaison Committee. It consists of teacher's aides, custodial people, and regular classroom teachers. And when there's things that need to be decided, we work on them together. And I would like to uh, incorporate officers having, and when I say officers, I mean everyone working there. There are jailers and dispatchers, but to have those folks part of a lot of the decision making, I think that that gets them a little skin in the game, then they have a little more ownership in what's happening. And so that's my leadership style, is to be collaborative. And my experience, because I have run a building, uh, I think would very well parallel with a lot of the responsibilities of being sheriff. And then just in closing, um, you know, there was some talk about the range and there being liabilities, and I just wanted to respond to that. 
county board would probably be the final decision maker on that, but I would advocate that there is liability in everything that we do. Every deputy who's carrying a firearm is a liability. Every person that we deal with is a liability. And you cannot escape lighting situations or people that haven't been involved in these dangerous situations. I think that when an officer's out there responding to a hostage situation or an active shooter, I don't care what you want to call the equipment, I want them to have the best that they can have. And if it's a high level body threat body armor or it's an armored vehicle, I'm all for it. I don't, it doesn't bother me if it scares somebody else. If that's going to stop bullets and protect my people, I support it. I just think it's in how you use it. I think, you know, if every single call you're rolling out the, the SWAT vehicle and kicking in doors with guys with hoods over their heads types of things, yeah, that's probably not good PR. But I do not believe that just because somebody's referring to something as paramilitary, it would make it a bad piece of equipment. You might get it for free. It provides high threat protection, and it can be very useful. So I'm not against high-end equipment. I'm not against equipment that saves lives, and I think that, unfortunately, it's gotten a bad rap by the many people who are trying to conflate police officers with rogue army regimes who come in and kick in doors and arrest people. That's not America. America, you have constitutional rights. You're protected by the Fourth Amendment from search and seizure. And just because an officer might be wearing a black uniform does not suddenly make him um, a combat soldier. It means that he's not going to be as easy to be seen when he's trying to enter a residence. So um, I support the use of equipment that the government is willing to give the officers. And I support anything that protects the officers. And if people don't like it, it's mostly because of the way it looks, just like they don't like the AR rifle, which is no different than any rifle. It just looks different. So um, I support the use of that equipment um, in a limited of fashion as needed. So um, we have what we call an MRAP. That is a, an old military vehicle. And um, why we have that is it's a protection. It's not armed with uh, with rifles or anything like that. So when they get these, when we get these from the government, they're they're not armed in any way. But what we use that for, and what's it, it's important for, is uh, it's somewhat at least bullet resistant. And if you can imagine, for example, an armed individual up a long driveway um, who has a deer rifle, because you know we're all kind of hunters in this part of the country, and everybody has a rifle. And in the old days, I'll give you an example. Many years ago, I was involved in a shooting and somebody was actually shot by, uh, an officer. And we had to go up and somehow get in that house. And we searched and tried to figure out how we were gonna do that. And what we ended up doing is just getting front end loader from the city. And I drove that up to the door with the bucket on. So that, and then as we got close, we hit behind the tires of this front end loader so that we could try to go in that house where that guy was shooting at us. Let me tell you, it's, it's a kind of a, it, it's an experience you may not want to do. So hiding behind that rubber tire, as opposed to riding in this nice armored vehicle, is a big difference. So what we can do nowadays is we can ride in that vehicle and actually drive up close to these houses, and if they were shooting at you, you can, you're in relatively safety there, and you can radio back to officers on the perimeter and those types of things because you're, you're, you can now see much better and you get much closer in safety. And it's all about the safety of our officers and the safety of these incidents coming out without any harm to even, even the, the suspect in our cases. So we don't use it as a, an attack vehicle or anything like that. We use it as a safety for our officers so that they can get closer to these scenes, radio back information, and we can, we can hopefully get negotiation processes going, but it gives us eyes on the ground and close to the incident. And you know, this is something that's not new. I think maybe 20, 25 years ago, some of the rifles we have here at the Sheriff's Department are, are actually from the military as well. So back then they refurbished some M16 rifles. We didn't have any. It was beyond our budget back in the day. And we were starting to go up against people with rifles and we had shotguns and you know the distance there is just not the same. 
So the government had these M16s and they, they allowed us to have those on the same type of program. We still have those and utilize those today. So there's some benefits to the taxpayer as well here. And there's accountability because I just did the, uh, uh, the accountability form here just recently. We have to document that we still have these, all this equipment that we, we've ever gotten from the government. We have to document them. We have to show pictures that we have still retained them in, in good working condition. And then if we don't use them or want to give them back, there's a process to do that as well. So none of this stuff is abused. None of it's used as an attack vehicle or any type of assault. They're used for officer safety issues. The, the reason that we have these pieces of equipment is because we need them. The Sheriff's Office has never frivolously bought things or we don't buy things because we want to look like military. We buy them because we need them. We need to protect our officers and we need to protect the public. We have rifles because we need to be able to shoot farther than a handgun can shoot sometimes. We have body armor that can stop rifle bullets because sometimes the people that we have to go against have rifles. And we have the armored vehicle because we need to be able to approach places and go places to rescue people, to rescue officers, because people might have weapons that can harm us. We never have frivolously spend money, and as sheriff, I will not frivolously spend money, but we do need to have the tools to protect our officers and to protect the public so that we can do our jobs. You only need to look in the media at a lot of the shootings that have happened recently. A lot of them are using weapons that have substantial range, can shoot at a high rate of fire, and we need to be able to protect ourselves, protect the public. That's the most important thing that we can do, is protect the public. Okay, this, uh, we're kind of running out of time, so this will be our final question. Um, I believe any of the candidates will be lingering a little bit after, so if you have specific questions you want to ask each of the candidates uh, you, you know after after the uh, uh, forms over you're, you're welcome to do so um, this will be our, our final question uh, it's an audience question your stance on the drug problem in our community uh, and uh, what what actions are you going to take to to, uh, to address this problem and uh, who will pay for it? So drugs, drug issues are never going to go away. They're likely to get worse. I think we've all kind of accepted that. Years ago that we had a marijuana problem, not that that isn't around, but now it's meth. And why it's meth is that's an easy, it's a cheaper drug to make. There's a higher profit margin there. Uh, they used to have a lot of the portable meth labs. We haven't been seeing those a lot lately because it's been cheaper to come up through Mexico now and, and they sell their profits that way. But so what are we going to do about that? So we have uh, recently just promoted a, a new drug detective. We also have the detective who was uh, formerly the drug detective in place. So we actually have two people working drugs right now. And what, what, uh, what we've been doing is a lot of behind the scenes stuff that a lot of people may not know. But typically what we do is, is we, we'll make buys in the community from our bad guys. Uh, we'll buy drugs uh, undercover, those types of things, they're using the operatives. And then we form our, uh, our cases that way and bring them to the district attorney. A lot of times they'll snowball and we'll try to get to the source that's bringing them into Taylor County if, if we can and we are actively doing that kind of thing. Um, we have a lot of drug programs in place. Obviously our canine demo, if you saw that earlier today, uh, he's out there a lot with us. The dog does a really great job at some of these search warrants and those types of things. And, and budgetary concerns are always there, but I think when it comes to the safety of our people and the drugs on our street that we want to take a really proactive stance on that and do everything that we can. So we have officers in place that are currently working on, on our drug issues, two detectives. We, uh, we can also have other sources from other counties. There's other programs that we all kind of work together. It's called Nordic and some other things where counties work together and we can kind of exchange resources. Things like body wires or cameras and all those types of things that we use behind the scenes. And that's a financial resource for us and a personnel resource. There's other things that uh, we do in our community, and that's things like garbage picks. If we know 
uh, a certain uh, drug house or something like that that we're interested in. We can go through the garbage. We can find uh, clues there and start watching things like that. There's other kinds of neat tricks that we kind of we can use. We can watch electrical bills sometimes in some cases. If somebody's electric bills are extraordinarily high, that might be a clue that there's a grow or heat lights in there, things like that. Um, so we're actively working on this in the community because we're aware as well as all you are that the drugs that are in our community are bad. We have a good community. The thing is that we're surrounded by other communities that, that have a harder drug problem than, I, than we do and it's going to filter through and there's no doubt about that. So we want to stay ahead of the curve and work these issues. Like most communities in the U.S. right now, Taylor County does have uh, problems with drugs, um, primarily with methamphetamines. Um, the Sheriff's Office is actively working. We actively investigate drug cases. We have detectives that are assigned specifically to in investigate drug uh, offenses and drug trafficking, and that will, of course, continue. Um, we do do a lot of things involving drug investigations, and uh, the people that we have working on it are very good at their jobs. The as sheriff, I will uh, continue these efforts and continue um, actively pursuing uh, drug cases and drug trafficking. Um, we have a very good group called the Taylor County Drug Opposition Council in Taylor County. We'll, the Sheriff's Office will continue working with them. Education is just as important of a component in fighting drugs as, as enforcement is. Um, it's important that we educate people so that they don't start using drugs in the first place. It's, you know, it, it's difficult, but we have groups, and as the Sheriff, I will make sure that the Sheriff's Office stays involved in that education component because that way we can stop people um, from using drugs before it starts. I believe that uh, the drug issue, as the others have mentioned, it's not going to completely go away, but there are ways to manage it. I would say that the fact that Taylor County doesn't have the drug problem that other counties have is an example of the fact that um, efforts that we are already doing do make a difference. Um, you're not going to arrest your way out of a, the drug problem. It's going to be there. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's really a three-prong approach. You have enforcement going on, which is a deterrent. So people that are getting caught, they're getting in trouble, they're maybe serving some jail time, they're getting fines. Um, that's an example for others. Like, I don't want to go that route because you know, if I end up getting arrested for felony drug possession, I'm going to lose my right to hunt because I can't carry a firearm anymore. So clearly enforcement's important. Education is also very important. The younger we get into the schools, the better it is. Now, years ago, they had a program called the D.A.R.E. program. Um, also, um, we have revenue uh, budgets as well. So last year in 2017, the Sheriff's Department made uh, almost $500,000 brought into our county here from, sta from uh, accepting prisoners from outside of the other jurisdictions. So a lot of the other jurisdictions, their jails are full and they can't house them. So then if we have open room in our jails, we can hold, I think, just under about 90. Um, then we can house those prisoners and we make money on that. So this year, I think we're uh, well on our way to make that income again, and that benefits everybody, every taxpayer in the county. So managing those things and not losing those resources is very important. We don't want to lose $500,000 a year into our county if we can help it. Um, and there's other things, there's rollover, so the budget renews every year, but there's also rollover line items. There's things like our patrol cars and things like that that we have to, to uh, replace every year. Well, those types of budget line items roll over, so you don't, you don't start out from zero again every, every year. So in terms of the budget, especially when you're talking a budget that big, there's a lot of uh, elements to it, and the sheriff's role is crucial in getting that budget uh, approved through the county. It also, um, and again, I don't want to belabor this issue, but I just want to make note as far as, and we're making an issue about this, and I don't want to, but um, as far as the the, uh, the liabilities, Mr. Everhart said about the officers carrying guns and all those things are all liabilities, and they all can be, but all those are, are protected statutorily, so we have statutory authority to do all those other things, and we're covered by the statutes for a lot of those liabilities, and the, the uh, counties uh, covered them. Um, certainly teaching citizens at, at our police range is not a statutorily covered uh, uh, 
thing so we wouldn't have some of those protections in place that we do just being out there as an officer and interacting with the public and doing our, our day to day job and that means carrying guns and those types of things. And the statutes actually are, are in place to cover officers for deadly force and all those kinds of issues where they're not in place for a lot of other things. Thank you. As an elected official, as the sheriff, um, one of the most important things you can do is protect our taxpayer resources, and namely, uh, the make sure that taxpayer dollars are being spent in the most efficient and effective way possible. Um, I have a strong background in technology, and one of the most expensive and uh, costly types of projects that we do in law enforcement now is technology related. Almost everything that we do in law enforcement involves technology, and I've been involved with all of the technology projects that we currently use, from our radio system, to our computer-aided dispatch, to our uh, citation and, and, and warning um, and crash reporting system. All those systems cost money, and you need to know how those systems work, because you need to know what the most effective and cost-efficient way to implement them is. A lot of vendors, they want to sell you something and they will say a lot of things to make sure that, that you choose them as, as the, you know, you buy their technology, you buy their service. And without that understanding, you can end up very deep down a costly hole and not have any way out when you have contracts and long-term contracts. My work in emergency management gave me a lot of experience in writing grants, and grants are an outstanding way to reduce the local taxpayer burden for uh, any of the technology projects or any projects in general. I have written over a million dollars in grants that has brought money into Taylor County to offset the cost of our radio system, our radios, in emergency management. The grants offset the cost of the actual emergency management position. I've written all of those grants, and I have experience writing grants, and I will continue doing that to reduce the cost and the burden to Taylor County taxpayers. And as one of the questions was scheduling, I already do scheduling. Um, as a supervisor, I am involved in the scheduling process, setting up schedules, and you know, as I look into more efficient ways to do things as far as scheduling, Again, using technology that I have a strong background in. Thank you. question here is uh, where do you draw your strength uh, or do you get or get your values from so where do you uh, where do you get your values from and, and your strength well where do I get my values from is my upbringing uh, my parents uh, they uh, you know they raised me to have to have good common sense good values um, I'm a conservative person you know we go to church those types of things I draw my values from that and my strength from that what was the second half of the question, Brian? Uh, your strength, your strength. Yeah. So I draw my strength from that and my courage from that. So my faith, my family values, um, and just the sense of wanting to do right and the responsibility of wanting to do right never leaves my mind that, uh, that I'm working for the public and uh, they're expecting us to do a good job. And when you're sleeping at night or you're going about your day at work, you're expecting that things are done right and that we're making the right decisions and doing the right things on your best path because it, that's what you're counting on. That's why you have all of us here and that's why you have us in office. So draw my strength on all my family core values and also trying to do the right thing for the public and so when they look at the decision you made or something that you've done that they can, they can look back and say, yeah, I think that was a good decision. You did the best thing that you could for our community. For me, 
see my parents and my the way I was raised is is what has made me the person I am today. Um, many of you know my parents, Stuart and Lynn Amundsen. Um, they've lived here their entire lives. Um, they are outstanding parents, and and I really am so thankful for uh, the way they raised me and the person that they've made me. They taught me the importance of honesty, integrity, doing what's right when nobody's looking, and always making sure that you're respectful of people and you treat people with dignity. In law enforcement, it's so important that we treat people um, respectfully because even when it's a negative contact um, that inevitably happened in law enforcement, people, when they're treated with respect and treated like a real person, they almost universally respond in the same manner. And I've been in law enforcement for over 12 years, and that has been the thing I've universally and always always the way I've done it because it just you get such better responses and and appreciation from people when you treat them that way and I just again my parents it's the, the way the reason I chose law enforcement is because that I can make such positive impacts in people's lives I can actually go out and make a difference. Even the small things like the, the little uh, letter I got, the coloring I got from a child, that's being able to make those positive impacts in people's lives really makes a difference and it, it, it makes me um, happy with what I do. I certainly, uh I'm not a perfect person, but I strive to do my best, and I basically, I draw my values through God. Um, I believe that uh, His forgiveness is for all of us, it's for me, but He certainly has outlined um, things for us to follow, things for us to, to do to lead a productive and good life, uh, from everything from, you know, not stealing and not killing to um, the simple philosophical things of, you know, helping the children and those types of things. So. My values come from him, and again, I do my best to, to meet those expectations, but we all fall short. Otherwise, we wouldn't need the salvation of Jesus. But those are the things I kind of look at, too, is how we should um, treat one another and what's fair and what's right. My strength comes from my belief that all things are possible. Um, it's easy to get overwhelmed, and just like a lot of people, things will come up in my life, and I get overwhelmed. And my wife is uh, very helpful with that. She's a business coach. And so she's got a lot of good little sayings for me, and she'll always start out with, you know, you can do this, let's just work through the process. And uh, she's right. Instead of always getting overwhelmed when we have big problems, we need to just break them down, chunk them into smaller problems, and then take them one step at a time and work through the process, and eventually you will get to the finish line. You just have to stay the course. So I think one of my strengths is certainly just the belief that we can achieve anything. Um, I think sometimes there's a sense from people like, well, that can't be done. You ever call customer service at any organization and ask them to help you? And they say, well, that can't be done, sir. Well, that can't be done, ma'am. And I think we have people who have walked on the moon and you're telling me I can't get a part through this company because their system isn't in place. I think that's wrong. I think that um, all things can be accomplished. We just have to focus on them, break them down into smaller pieces, and we can accomplish anything. Okay, we have uh, another audience question. And we have, uh, what are the biggest needs and issues facing the, the Sheriff's Office and Taylor County as a whole? And what would you do to address those issues? I think right now, uh, the, one of the biggest needs um, and issues is uh, recruiting and retaining good people, particularly in the jail. Um, the way that we do that is we, you know, look, I take a look at our hiring process and look at the onboarding process when people join a department like how, how things are done when, when they join and making employees feel valued and respected and, and wanted in the positions that they are in. Um, one of the biggest things, like everybody wants to feel valued, everybody wants to feel um, like they belong and that 
they are important to the operations. And every single one of the employees of our agency is absolutely critical to our operations. We don't have extra people. We don't have people that everybody needs to be able to do their job. And it's so important both for the efficiency of the department. People work best when they feel valued, when they know that they are important and they are cared about. So. I will make sure, as the leader of the Taylor County Sheriff's Office, that I make sure every employee knows that they are important, that they are a critical part of our operation, and I will work and work hard to listen to their ideas, listen to their concerns, understand why they feel that way, and work towards implementing changes that will make them feel and want to stay and remain with the Taylor County Sheriff's Office. We have a lot of good people. All of our people are outstanding, good employees that do a great job, and we need to be able to keep those employees. So the biggest issue, I think, it depends on who you're asking, because everybody whatever issue is concerning them is probably the biggest issue. But I think there are areas, I think uh, Mr. Amundsen's correct, um, recruiting good employees and then maintaining their employment is an issue. I think it's not just because something's wrong at the Taylor County Sheriff's Department, that's not it. I think it's a tough job. People that get into law enforcement, you know, it's a lot of it's based on television. It's gonna be action, it's gonna be running around, and then they do an OWI stop and the rest of their evening is done. They're at the hospital waiting for a blood draw. They're reading and informing the accused and it's it's not the excitement that they had maybe hoped for. And then sometimes bureaucracy and other things come into play and they lose their enthusiasm and then they leave their jobs. There's a lot of money that goes into continuing to train an officer to continue to keep his certifications up. Um, we don't want to lose that. So certainly um, maintaining qualified employment there's a saying that says people don't quit jobs, they quit managers. And unfortunately, that's quite often the truth. People just don't like working for certain groups or individuals. And so my goal would be, of course, to help employees feel valued, help give them stakeholder responsibilities and some of the decision making so that they um, feel that they are part of the department. And if there's a problem, the answer is not to leave, it's to help fix it. So that's one of the things. I think another issue that certainly is a priority is drugs. As we know, drugs are a problem. Some communities, it's, it's out of control. Merrill has a huge heroin problem. Um, drugs are always gonna be an issue. Marathon County, I think they've got 100% more kids in foster care this year than last year, and most of them it's because they're coming from drug-endangered homes. So drugs is certainly gonna be an issue. Taylor County, in my opinion, has done a great job in enforcing uh, drug laws and infiltrating those that are dealing drugs and keeping drugs to a minimum here. Um, but they're still around. I'm also a principal of our alternative high school, and a lot of the kids that I work with there have issues with substance abuse. It's hard to stop once they are involved in that. So I think we should have a three-pronged approach as a community. We certainly need law enforcement, and they have been doing a good job. We need to increase education, and then we need to have more intervention options for those who have got caught up in the drug world. And then finally, I think that uh, one of the big needs for the department is just investing in ongoing training. Your officers and the people there are your key to what's going on. And there's a minimum requirement of 24 hours every year to keep your certifications up, but there's a big difference between just doing the minimum and doing what needs to be done. I think laws are constantly changing and officers, number one, it gives them a little break of the daily routine when they're at a training. Number two, it rejuvenates them. They get a chance to meet with officers from other departments and other areas. And number three, it makes them better officers. So I think a big issue is to make sure that we manage the budget, but that we apply money in the areas where it's important. And that would be training for the officers and, and uh, uh, the other employees in the department.
couple of the budget issues facing the sheriff's department, and uh, I'm going to echo some of the things that I've already said, and that's our staffing levels in our jail. You know, it's a tough job. It's a 24-7 operation. Whenever you expect people to come in day and night and work weekends, uh, it's tough on them. Uh, and we got to appreciate that. Not everybody wants to, uh, when a lot of us are going to bed, you know, they're just starting work. So that's one of the things that's, uh, that's tough, and we got to make our people happy if we can to retain them. Um, you know, I think uh, part of it's just the, the tough job and the tough hours. Part of it's our, our uh, society nowadays. I think I read somewhere where, you know, back, well, here, I've been here 30 years. Uh, a lot of you out there have probably been where you were working a long time, but uh, nowadays they say three, four years and people are moving on. That's kind of the common thing. So we're fighting that as well. But some of the things we have to change and help keep our people in the jail, and, and we're actively working on that right now. So I've been working with Sheriff Daniels on the 2019 budget, and some of the things that we've been looking at is giving some of our jailers some incentive pay. So a lot to, to get a little incentive pay for that. Things like calling people in on their off days or calling them in on their unscheduled time. And uh, that's something that we deal with. It's a, it's a real issue. It's something that we deal with in law enforcement here in the Sheriff's Department. You know, we're very leanly staffed. And when somebody calls in sick or is out on some sort of medical reason or anything like that, um, all that trickles down on, on our scheduling and you may get called in on a day off and maybe you're planning that family picnic or whatever, you know, that's hard on our people. And uh, so we're looking at maybe having some call and pay to, to, to ease some of that discomfort of having to come in when you normally wouldn't. Um, longevity pay, things like that. Um, another thing that, that, that's facing us beyond keeping our employees, which is important because that also costs money to retrain. So when it, it costs money, and when I say money, it's, it's your guys' money, you guys sitting out here. So it costs money to advertise and hire people and go through that process because we can't just hire them. They have to get psychologicals, they have to get physicals, they have to get drug, drug testing, and we have to pay for all that. And not only to mention all, all the, uh, the advertising and the background and everything to hire people, the uniform.